the Arts Research Center, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Thank you so much for being here, especially those of you for whom this is the first time in the Townsend Center. I'm glad that you found us. I'm glad that I hope you found parking or walked up from the park and got here okay. And um, and it is, I think, this is such a lovely building inside of a lovely little grove, um, but it's also hard to find. So thank you for finding it and allowing yourself the time to do so. Uh, it is a thorough pleasure to welcome you all to Curating People. Uh, this, as uh, much of the promo around this has uh, suggested, we're interested here in gathering people from different art spaces, different organizations, from different sectors of the community to think about a brand of social engagement in art practice, about modes of art making that involve people not only as um, authors behind the scenes, but as people, but as the material of the art event, something that is on some level familiar in theater and dance, but um, interestingly defamiliarized by the kind of people-based work that is happening under the guise of museums, galleries, and other site-specific and community-based community um, organizations right now. So this is a big, wide, um, wide field, a big, wide field of work. And this is just the first of what we hope, uh, a kind of pilot version of what we hope might be uh, future structured gatherings and uh, reflection about processes, systems, and opportunities for partnerships and coalitions um, that we hope, uh, under the banner of the ARC, will be able to enable in collaboration with many of the organizations represented in this room. I also um, want to be sure that we thank the people who really made this possible. Um, uh, the Arts Research Center was very pleased to have a certain amount of funding to get things off the ground, but it couldn't have been possible if we didn't also receive support from departments on campus, uh, including the Department of Art Practice, the History of Art Department, Rhetoric, Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies, the Critical Theory Program here at Berkeley, the Berkeley Center for New Media, the Townsend Center for the Humanities, in which we're working, Cal Performances, Berkeley Art Museum, Pacific Film Archive, Performance Art Institute, and SF Performances for their in-kind support throughout as well. So, um, if we can give a brief thank you to those organizations. <laughs> later, later today, I will have a, a larger thank you for um, the people who have curated curating people. Uh, um, but I do, it is important for me to acknowledge now so that you can thank them throughout the day, uh, those who have been absolutely central to the support network. Um, and for me, philosophically, I don't actually believe that anything exists um, without um, a wider support network. It's hardly this ancillary activity, but it's fundamental to me being able to be who I am and I think art being able to be what it is. Um, so for, uh, uh, there's a group of graduate students who have been our run crew and will be throughout the day. A couple of them are here, and I'll point out a few of them earlier. Uh, Ashley Carroll Murray, are you here? Yes. Uh, Angela, Angela Maria Segura is here. Okay. And uh, others, uh, Julia Jarko last night, Raghini Srinivasan. Um, are, are there others in the team here now? Right. Our prime graduate student leader, um, head of the chorus, uh, Laura Richard, has been an absolute phenomenal presence and <laughs> I think I have a chance to thank all of them later, but also uh, we want, uh, uh, it is ter terribly important for me, um, for us to honor the person who has been um, my absolute, the person who finishes my sentences and Sometimes I finish hers whether she wants it or not, and who has been just an incredible creative force um, over this last year in reorganizing ARC and thinking about what we might do with the resources we have on campus, Michelle Rapkin. <laughs> not spend that much time with introductions because you have your programs and your bios, but because she has such a short bio, I want to be sure that um, I that we, before I hand uh, over the um, of business to our first present, our, our first panel, um, our moderator, uh, Lee um, Markopoulos, uh, has uh, graciously agreed to serve as moderator and wrangler 
for a really um, fabulous array of people that we have here. Lee, in addition to being chair of the graduate program in curatorial practice, has many other things that she comes to us um, from um, doing um, incredible work at the Serpentine Gallery and then also as uh, former director of, of the Rena Branstein uh, Gallery. She has curated over 50 exhibitions. She is a passionate critic, scholar, catalog writer, and that band, I think, whether as a pedagogue, a curator, or a writer, <coughs> she carries with her a sort of no-nonsense commitment to excellence that we all appreciate, and I think we're really thrilled that she agreed to kick things off for us today. So, Lee. Um, so I'd like to start by welcoming you all, welcoming you all here today. Uh, the title of our panel is uh, When Presenters Become Curators and When Curators Become Presenters, and we'll get more into that obviously as the panel progresses. But we're going to start off by hearing from each of the panelists. Um, they'll be coming up to the podium and talking to you for a few minutes about um, a little bit about their practice, about the areas they're working on, their areas of interest, so as to contextualize the discussion that follows. And then immediately afterwards, I'll summarize things somewhat, ask a couple of questions to get things going, and then we want to hand over the floor to a general Q&A. You can see looking around the room that we've got not only curators and presenters, but practitioners, critics, writers, and we'd like to hear from all of you. So that will be the second part of today's um, proceedings, or this first panel's proceedings. So I'd like to start by calling Angela. Again, about a deep passion and a, a commitment to looking at international exchange. What I was doing was administering grant programs. We got U.S. artists abroad. We brought international artists here. And again, looking at these deep, rich issues around uh, this global dialogue. Looking at urgent issues around international work, culturally specific work, and notions of cultural understanding. And all of that comes to bear in terms of the work that I do at the Buena Center for the Arts. Um, I feel it's a privilege to be working where I do. I've been there for about seven and a half years, and I've grown within that institution. I'm very happy to be running in, this in, the, in the house who saw me like day one, you know, very green and naive. I didn't know what it was to be a curator. I didn't know what it was to, um, to select artists. I thought naively it was, oh, it's good, good work, <laughs> and people will come. And it's been in the seven and a half years with the brilliant leadership of Ken Foster, who's in the house today, of really unpacking what it means to select and mediate and present work for audiences. And it's very complicated, and it's just as much about concept and artistic values as it is about implementation. And one of the things that I appreciate about Shannon Jackson's approach around this gathering is a, just as much of a validation around the people that make this work happen, and the practical elements that go into this are just as, I feel like there's an art to the practical. There's an art to wrangling the human beings around this work. There's an art to manifesting artist vision from concept to implementation. Um, briefly, you know, I think many of you know you're going to Center for the Arts, but just to get us on the same page, um, at YBCA, we are a multidisciplinary contemporary art center based in San Francisco. So we present performing arts, visual arts, film and video, community engagement programs, all within a coherent artistic vision with values around innovation, experimentation, and really looking at uh, work that explores key issues and ideas that we think are urgent, that we think are relevant for our cultural moment right now. Um, and it's a privilege to work there. It's a privilege to work for a place that values experimentation. But we are very firmly centered in a space, um, in two buildings, two theaters and galleries and a screening room. And I think one of the things I wrestle with that I think is applicable for today is how does an institution support experimentation within these particular walls, within a very particular architecture, with, um, a very, with very particular values around the different architectural spaces on site. So one of the things that I think about a lot is, you know, what are the values embedded in our gallery spaces that may be very different histories and values that are embedded in our two theaters? And what is it to support those spaces, which we like to do sometimes? But again, we are always in relationship to that space and that architecture to a certain degree. In terms of my own curatorial practice and what, um, what drives me and what moves me, again, is 
to support artists who are taking risks in their work, to support artists who aren't interested in, in, in staying within certain ordinary boundaries, who are pushing the boundaries of form, um, artists who are engaging in collaborations. I, in the last couple of years, I've been very interested in performing artists who want to work with uh, visual artists, um, artists who are creating interdisciplinary works, um, artists who are collaborating cross-culturally. These have been all aspects of my curatorial practice that I've been um, exploring for the last couple of years. You know, but ultimately for me, you know, curating is, you know, it's about people. It's about people and it's about relationships for me. So a lot of my approaches in, in curating are, you know, to build trust and to build understanding of an artist's work. And so sometimes I'm, I, I would say I'm a pretty conventional performing arts presenter. Sometimes I just pick a great work and present it, but I use that as a starting point. And for the artists that I think are absolutely visionary, you know, I build from there. And without a strong foundation of trust with the artists I'm working with, um, I can't go further. So what I like to do is to build those long-term relationships and to then see how I can fully manifest their vision. And one of the things I think about a lot is, as I'm trying to support innovation and as I'm trying to support experimentation in the creative process, you know, what do I need to do? How do I need to adapt? Um, you know, I have examples, you know, of the last couple of years of artists who I think are brilliant, and I have to figure out how to adapt and make it work in in my particular space. Um, an example, you know, a couple examples that I think are. White Icon arrives tomorrow. <laughs> I assure you, there's no underwriting here. <laughs> well, we can do it. Uh, <laughs> um, but I would love an example of White Icon. If anybody knows anybody, that would be delightful. Um, but, it, you know, again, for the purposes of today's conversation, again, I feel there's so many interesting tensions and challenges and opportunities to be curating performing arts within this larger context to be presenting performance work alongside visual arts and film video that are fascinating. And I won't spend too much time talking about it, but things that, there's all these practical things that come up for us on a day-to-day -day basis around, you know, our timelines for curating and performing arts are drastically different than curating timelines for film video, from the, the timelines for curating visual arts. You know, we're always in this, this moment of trying to, you know, connect, but there's also a lot of tensions around how do we come together. But I love, you know, curating interdisciplinary performance within this particular context because I, I firmly believe that, you know, I don't want to be curating performance solely for insider performing arts people um, only. I want to be drawing upon a diverse audience um, of visual arts thinkers, of film video thinkers, and I need their minds engaging with the work that I'm doing. And we constantly strive to figure out ways to do that. Um, and I'm also looking for help around that. But that's a, a great priority for me. Because ultimately, you know, my selection process is one thing, but it's kind of, it, it's not done. The, the, the curatorial process isn't finished unless there's an audience engaging with the work. And we spend a lot of time thinking about audiences, but that's absolutely crucial. It does not, it's not finalized until I have minds and bodies and hearts engaging with this work and wrestling with it and, and resonating or not resonating with it. Um, right, I'm winding down. In, in closing, I just want to, um, I know I could blabber on for ages, there's so much to talk about, um, but just to wind down, I, I'll just throw out a couple of projects that I think may or may not come up later in terms of ideas. Um, I'll talk about very briefly, you know, I've supported artists who are collaborating with visual artists and their problems arise. One, I supported a, an artist named Nick Cave, a fantastic visual artist who creates these extraordinary full body sound suits. They are visual art sculptures. What is it to commission a choreographer to work inside a visual art piece? You know, a, what is it to then register a costume? <laughs> you know, some of the issues that we're going to get at today, I think, about what are these complexities about these kinds of visual arts worlds coming together with performance worlds, and how do you deal with that? You know, dealing with thousands of dollars worth of a visual art piece that then becomes costume and registering it. To how do you support artists whose whose practice? is cross-disciplinary and they need to, to burst outside of the proscenium. How do we as a contemporary arts center, how do, do I as a performing arts curator support that work? And I have case studies to show how I may or may not have successfully done that. But these are things that we constantly are wrestling with. And as a curator, you have to constantly adapt. And hopefully, by being centered in a contemporary arts center, that's the one of the ripest places to be dealing with these issues. And, and that's a privilege to work there. So I'll wrap up. and. Uh, 
turn things over. Well, thank you. Thanks. Um, 
And the other thing that I think is interesting in terms of theater is the artist control of the audience performer contract, and that's ch really changed over time in theater. But then, when, but then when you walk in a room, there are certain ways that an artist, the, the theater maker, the playwright, the producer, could let you know how is this going to be? Is there a fourth wall? Is there not a fourth wall? Are you allowed to get up and go? Are we in a circle? Are we outdoors? You know, the kind of art, the, the, the kind of thought that goes around, what are the rules of us being in this space and time together? I think that's interesting, and I've seen that um, really blur over, of course, um, the disciplines. Um, some things that I've noticed, um, visual um, art, artists coming from the visual art practice um, do well that I'm learning from are really um, a really concrete awareness of their place in arc and history um, that I think uh, we're lacking a little bit in performance. Um, I didn't come from um, an academic uh, background in that way. I did study theater and theater history, but it sort of ended at, I don't know, Brett or something. <laughs> Where's the history of, of now? Um, that I feel like I'm learning on a very practical level directly with artists. Um, and I guess I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing now at PICA. We do have this great festival, I think, there was a time to wind up, two minutes, um, called the 10 Day Start Festival. And um, we, it took us a long time to come up with that name, and one of the reasons that we really like it is that it's TBA, um, to be announced. And our, and, and our hope is that we'll be able to create a festival that people trust us enough and are curious enough about to come and have no idea who the artists are, are going to be that they're going to be with, but just know that they're going to be there for 10 days, they're going to be with their friends, they're going to have a good time, and they're going to be inspired, and they're going to like maybe 20% of the things that they see a lot and have arguments about the other ones, or vice versa. Um, that's been working really well for us. Um, one thing that's missing, I think, for, for me personally, is that I don't get to spend as much time with, with each artist. Um, and so in terms of a, a curatorial practice, um, the part of it that, that seems uh, really rewarding for me in the word curate and the definition of to care, um, and to be with that artist in time, um, quite literally, um, I think that as we're um, working alongside artists to create and present this work in a very experimental way for us as an institution and for the artists, it is hard to slow down and have that meta experience of documenting or kind of figuring out what our place in history is. I think that we're, we're, we're struggling a little bit just to keep our heads above water, just to make it happen, and then to remember even to take a picture sometimes <laughs> um, is a struggle um, for us. So that's an area we're working on, something I think we can really learn um, from visual arts practice and from institutions who do have buildings and libraries and collections, which PICA really doesn't at this point. We have an archive of a lot of DVDs um, of performances that, you know, I certainly don't find the time to sit down and watch as often as I'd like to, but at least we're recording it. Um, I guess that's about all I had to say, so um, thank you. Who are looking at 
Um, Teresa works where she's looking at this um, from the point of view of um, she's working with female comics um, and she does stage photographs with them. And um, what you start to get into here are issues of who gets to speak, who's in front, um, who's allowed to be in front of the stage, and who is actually behind the stage. And um, even for those who are in front of the stage, can we be our can we have to put a blanket over our heads in order to really um, um, be able to feel comfortable in saying what we want to say. Um, so this is really, a, I would say, a global phenomenon. Um, you can see this kind of work. I mean, this is just a few examples of artists, and visual artists, who are negotiating um, the, uh, the stage itself. And I think that in many ways, both the stage and the exhibition space are in crisis. Uh, they're in crisis because of the pressure from what I call the Facebook generation, not only I, but that is considered the Facebook generation. And so, um, as we, uh, there are so many other ways for people to consume culture, um, to expand um, their sense of um, self and to know the world, there's pressure on the, the sites that really require the live bodies to be present. And I think that while um, these artists are looking at the, the traditional stage, they're also cons considering their own dilemma. Um, there's also often um, a political nature to this. So this is, um, these are stills from a video where this performer continues coming on to the curtain, sort of ad nauseum. For 50, she comes in, she goes out, she comes in, she goes out. And here, of course, the curtain and its sort of se sexual nature, um, the curtain and, you know, you can do a whole sort of feminist reading of what this curtain is about. Or you could do, um, obviously, um, different kinds of things with the curtain. Is that um, it's, it's something that, um, it's a, it's a space that, that probably um, has been and will continue to be um, one that artists can think about. Um, the, so with, with the Facebook situation <laughs> um, and the whole desire for participation, um, more and more artists are trying to figure out or are working in a way where you can become um, the performer. So this is uh, Seattle Sawyer's work. That's um, I saw it um, at MoMA in New York, and um, what was really cool is I was able to take um, a picture on my cell phone of you know, other people performing so that there was this kind of cyclical relationship. And even though this looks like it might be a bigger projection, it is actually the theatrical light projection itself. Um, so um, this, there's a stripped down um, materiality. Um, to um, the presentation of the work. And this is the kind of work that certainly has been flourishing for quite a while and that um, um, museums and exhibition space are trying to negotiate. So whereas the flat um, curtain kind of presents one situation, um, artists like Ulla von Brandenburg, um, who was an artist in our um, first iteration of the audience's subject exhibition, was a different work, is opening up to a another kind of participation where you can actually become an actor in the space. She is just constructing various ways of entry and various ideas about curtaining, about concealment, about um, entering as part of the installation. And this is a work that was at the CCA and it was a Plaza exhibition that she did, um, which is also about um, concealment and revealing um, related to the Wizard of um, I'm going to end my presentation with uh, the artist Tani Bruguera, and uh, here's a slide of an installation view um, of a work that was initially a performance space work, and I think this is also an issue for um, people in my field, is how do you work with performative based work and then show it as um, an object, an installation object. So this is what the work became. And this is what the work was. And I actually have, if you guys can spare with me, um, So I'll actually show um, this clip, because I think that, for me, this is where um, this coming together of the visual arts and performing arts really um, has an enormous amount of power.
the dove is to um, a speech that Fidel did in 1959 about freedom. And um, the people were coming up and basically criticizing the government for various forms of uh, censorship and repression. The uh, presentation was shut down after just one event. And um, it is kind of the next step to the earlier slides that I was sending you, showing you. And I just also want to mention um, another project that I hope to bring to San Francisco, which is a project that Tanya did at Tate Modern, um, actually in 2008, which uh, involved um, a different kind of notion of, of division and separation and the relationship of um, that, that certain kinds of divisions have with power. Um, I'm not sure if this is
in my life. Um, that is to get more artist voices inside of the walls of the museum, not just on the walls of the museum. In 1988, I got a job as an educator at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Um, Walker's commitment to being a catalyst for art and artists across disciplines, combined with a very real commitment to engagement with uh, its community, made it kind of, kind of like heaven. Uh, this was the time of Karen Finley, uh, Tim Kelly, Guilty Jones, and uh, Tanya Vera was up there. Uh, uh, Guilty Jones and Elizabeth Strubber just getting started out in their careers. Uh, Bruce Nauman was becoming mainstream. PS 122 was sending out field trips. Um, and the culture wars was claiming real victims at that time. Um, not only were the leading artists of the time in our galleries, in the theater, and out in the community, um, but we were encouraged, as a staff, we were encouraged to apply their and our own creativity and excellence in the way we did our jobs. For me, that meant hiring actors and dancers to perform in the galleries, commissioning visual artists, uh, designers, and architects to transform classrooms into art installations that could educate experientially, it meant working with museums and writers to create audio tours. Wall labels could be poems. And every audience, young and old, educated or not, rich or poor, was deemed important. I would say the content at Walker was not discipline specific. That definitely was not discipline specific. It wasn't historical. And I wouldn't, it wasn't even really restricted to art. I would say the content was creativity itself and the power to open mind, or the power of open mind. While staff had a specific job to do, there was collegiality and openness to working together across the traditional titles of educator, presenter, curator, director. Our director spoke of her desire to move what we see in the dark spaces up to the light spaces and vice versa. There was a real sense of making it up every day. Okay. So I've sort of idealized that in my memory. It wasn't really quite, <laughs> <laughs> really quite right there, but um, uh, so I left. Um, <laughs> um, uh, in 2004, though, um, I uh, took my current job as director of programs at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. Institute of Contemporary Art has been around uh, for 70 years. Uh, first institution in the um, country to be the Institute of Contemporary Art. Uh, started out as a museum of modern art. And, Moved on. Uh, after 70 years, at that point, it was still struggling to remain marginal. And um, we, they, they decided to build a new building on the waterfront uh, that would triple its size, triple its budget, triple the size of its staff. Um, and um, it was, we, the ICA was awarded the site um, in a competitive process uh, because of the promise to bring people down there both day and night. And the performing arts and film programming was seen as a key means to that end, at least in the evenings. Um, likewise, uh, it offered us the ability for the first time to present the full spectrum of contemporary art. I was asked to establish the performing arts program um, and oversee the film and education programs. We opened the building in 2006. Um, and we all went through a very large learning curve. Uh, neither I nor the, arts, nor the institution had run a performing arts program before. And um, conceptually, I have to say, knowing what to present was not the most difficult part of the job at that point. Um, in fact, it was the easiest part of the job at that point. Uh, knowing what kind of staff you needed was, was an issue. What kind of equipment you were going to need was an issue. Um, what kind of technologies you were going to need and learning the economic and administrative systems to um, run those programs, uh, um, that was an immediate challenge. That was a much more immediate challenge. The ICA, for 70 years, had been a visual arts organization, almost genetically, from the trustees through the staff and to the audiences. Over the past four years, we worked very hard um, to change that attitude. Um, and I now have a very enthusiastic trustee committee um, devoted to the theater program. It's actually, it's one of my proudest achievements is <laughs> having a trustee committee that really supports the performing arts. Um, 
This kind of behind the scenes institution building is vitally important to understanding what art gets presented and what does not. Today, the IC is in a position to hire leading curators, commission leading artists such as Mark Morris, Bill T. Jones, Travis Harrell, Swoon, uh, the poet Anna Carson. We presented performances throughout the building. Uh, we have introduced Boston art uh, audiences to artists that had not been there before, like Tim Crouch, Young Jean Lee, Xavier Leroy, uh, Kara Donovan, Shepard Ferrick, Shepard Ferrick, then they put it not, not in the movie, uh, and many more. And while we're in the business of presenting the best of the new, we also have to be sure, Angela was speaking, I think, quite articulately about this, we have to be sure to bring our audience along. As someone who spent the better part of my professional career as a museum educator, I can say, and this is also very proud of, that institutions today recognize that artists will lead the way, but we need to make sure that people are following. I mentioned that we presented Xavier Leroy. He was in Boston at the same time that Tino Segal show was up at the Guggenheim. And uh, Xavier um, had actually been a mentor to Tino. Uh, and so we had a lot of interesting conversations about the relationship between Xavier's work and uh, Tino's, Tino's work. Here's just a couple things which I think are sort of interesting. Xavier gets paid a fee when he does a performance. It's in the low five figures. Tino sells his performances well into the six figures. Um, another difference, Xavier really gets his audience there for the whole performance. He relies on the full attention of that audience over time. Whereas performance was presented in the gallery, um, like art in the gallery, it's just taken in at whatever pace uh, and time that the visitors choose. No beginning, no end. Um, these are two obvious but very, um, I think, important distinctions um, between those dark spaces and light spaces. I would add also that um, performing arts has a much more complicated relationship with entertainment than the visual arts does. How much time? Minus one. <laughs> 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 Let's stop there. <laughs> Let me just say one thing, um, uh, two, two things actually. The first curator I worked with at the ICA, I had a very civil relationship with, but not a particularly collegial relationship. And um, we, I don't think he came to more than one or two of my books over the three years that he was there, and I don't think um, he ever showed any interest in performative uh, practice. Um, we hired a new curator quite recently. Um, first show she proposed is a show called Dance Draw that quite literally looked at the relationship of those two since the Judson Church, and it has been a joy to think about developing the program and exhibition together. Uh, we have really, I think, learned a lot from each other in this process, at least I'll say that, I hope she would too. Um, uh, finally, the last thing I want to say, that in building this institution, um, I've expected, or a couple, I can't remember the building institution, but my, my part in that, um, I expect my staff to love working with artists. As I said at the beginning, Bringing an artist's voice inside the wall is really important. I want every artist who comes through the ICA to give their best and feel like their best is rewarded. When I identify an artist to work with, I want them to know why we engage them, what our goals are. I want them to know what the parameters of this project would be, um, time, resource, and geography. Uh, it's very important, and because it's rare that you can offer artists all that they want. Um, finally, last thing, dealing with agents is different than dealing with artists. Hi, I think because I'm last, and also because Erin, my colleague, has all, uh, spoken so eloquently about what we do at Pike, I might take a, di a little different turn with what I'm going to say, and please keep me on time and cut me short, whatever you want to. Um, my name is Christine Kennedy, I'm the visual art curator at PICA in Portland. And um, I'll say that my title has been a point of contention with myself and no one else over the years. Um, my first interaction with PICA 
it was to protest the organization when I moved to <laughs> Portland in 1995, and I knew absolutely nothing about it, although I perceived it as a giant behemoth institution, and therefore I must rail against it by showing up at their fundraiser, stealing some juice, and, and making it happen, <laughs> happen, to which they fully embraced. <laughs> um, our uh, founder, Christy Edmonds, pulled the curtain away from where we were performing and said, Who are you guys? This is great. <laughs> 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 um, and over the years, uh, Heiko made it a point of uh, bringing me into the organization in various ways through volunteering, um, allowing me to subvert its process as an artist um, and a maker, and then bringing me into the process of how they run their um, Institute. I, ha I still have a problem with the word institution, um, and so I call PECA the institution, and in many ways we are that still to this day. Um, so I'm an artist who found herself as a volunteer uh, scraping fish guts off of warehouse floors for other artists, um, who, and, and being relatively anonymous to exhibiting in a, a former gallery of ours, um, which was then a abandoned. Um, to um, bringing in a lecture series and residency series and then eventually taking on the title of visual art program director. And then finally last year saying um, to my executive director, I think I need the word curator on my title after six years of presenting um, artist projects and their work. And she said, I tried to give you that the first day you walked in the door. But to me at that time, as someone who had studied visual art, it meant this thing that I really don't feel it means anymore. And I will um, advocate to that till death that the, um, the definition of um, curator as writer and arbiter of taste is not one that I subscribe to, although I appreciate those who do and I go to see their exhibitions and read their texts. Um, what I am more interested in is something that um, uh, in our earlier session became clear to me um, when um, Minha uh, told, recounted a story, and I'm sorry to paraphrase it, about her experience going to Japan as an invited guest and being led through a series of um, you know, open-ended activities like walking down a path to an empty field and how it changed her perception of her own work and the work around her. And I think after having all this conversation about the logistics of presenting and whether you're a curator or whatever you are, um, what really came back to me is that that is the thing that I love most about my job and feel fortunate that I work in an institution that supports it, that I invite an artist and I follow them down a path and they lead me to an open-ended field and whether it succeeds or fails, I don't care. I just want to say yes and to be the institution that continually does that although there are some very real uh, practical concerns that come into it. Um, I'll end um, with my manifesto by saying that um, <laughs> the artists that I have presented in my program, because PICA um, started as both a, a multidisciplinary organization that didn't really care about form, but other people did. So they would say, oh, they're a performing arts presenter, or oh, they do one exhibition a year. We didn't care. And I think part of taking on the uh, name of curator was really so um, dealers and other people would answer my emails. <laughs> Less about my um, interaction with artists, who, which has been very rich and open. It's been about the acceptance of my colleagues or an understanding it's like a secret password that gets you in, into doors. But the artists that I've presented, like Sarah Reeder Garafferty, Matthew Jackson, Matthew De Jackson, Charlie Atlas, um, everyone worked with him, he's incredible. Um, that really are talking about this theatrical space. Um, Brody Condon, who you know, you go into his studio and um, he's reading Breck. So there are a lot of artists who are investigating um, forms of theater in the avant-garde, um, but making other types of work with it. Um, when we talk about the ideas of artists, it's then there's no conversation about form or material, and that is where I would like to live. Although I talk a lot about funding and all those other things. Um, one of the artists that I'm going to be presenting this year is, Claire, is a collaborative Claire Fontaine, and they um, presented a, a challenging installation to me, which they've done a couple of times. I don't know if you know their work, but they sent me a video of them, uh, a, a, a dealer lighting their installation on fire, which was 60,000 matches in the shape of friends in a gallery. And as I watched the gallery go up on flames, I was like, that's exactly what I want to do. 
Um, uh, but Heike, for the last three years, has inhabited this old abandoned schoolhouse. And every time we go in there, we're talking about the care of the building and the people that are in it. And so for me to go in on my last year there, probably, um, as it will be developed into condos or something horrible, um, uh, and to present a program called Evidence of Bricks, which is about the tearing down and building up of institutions, ideas, and societies. Um, and I want to invite Claire Fontaine to screw with the building. How do I get the permits to do so will become an issue. And I count on all of the, Aaron said, well, we'll treat it like we do theater on stage. And David talked about almost burning down his school. So I need the experience of the presenters, curators, performers in the room to teach me how to burn a school down this year. Thank you. Thank you. Based performance, 
And I, I think without that kind of space, that we would, I would be in a, a much more difficult position to provide you know, opportunities for audiences to engage with a level of experimentation that I think that they are craving. David, did you want to yeah, um, Just to sort of echo a little bit, but also to maybe turn, turn the question a little bit. There's not a right answer. I mean, I think each project, you have to sort of, that, that, that I sort of look at it in my job as, how much do I need to bring it in and when do it, when's the right time? An artist who is doing a fairly traditional performance in the theater or hanging something on the wall in case the audience knows what their, you know, what their um, engagement, how it's supposed to look, needs less preparation. Um, both the audience, neither the audience or the artist need a lot of preparation in that case. Um, when an artist tries to break that um, up a little bit, I think you need to work with them to make sure that they get the effect that they're looking for, and the audience can engage with it the way they want. We're doing a project right now with Travel Harrell and Sarah Z, the sculptor, um, and it's going to um, premiere in November. Uh, Trajal is thinking, uh, Trajal and Sarah are thinking that it's gonna, it could take place in the theater, or it could take place in the galleries. Um, and he sort of wants to have two versions of it, actually. So we've been having conversations about audience right, right along on that project. Um, but for the reason that it's in the galleries, it's a very different kind of way we want our audiences to come. Actually, sorry, Julian, do you want to So I, I want to actually to ask, uh, I noticed in the, in the various discussions, this interesting sort of pitch back and forth between a language of uh, a kind of institutional speech and something that sounds a lot more like a language of you know a crazy of subversion, transgression, crossing borders, boundaries, etc. And it start, started to seem to me that this kind of there's like an axis around this particular relationship in the various uh, presentations that related to something that was uh, in the title of Betty Sue's talk, which is the question of power. Um, and I would love it if we could uh, speak a little bit to the relationships of, of power that embody the kind of uh, the, the, the relationships that you speak about between curator and artist, which seems so congenial. Um, you know, and, and if that question might not be uh, one that's not just about power in the Colbian sense, but also labor power, contract based labor, as compared to salary labor. You know, if you might just speak a little bit more directly about the relationships that inhabit this this happy conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, sorry for the documentation. So Julian's question, which I won't be able to repeat as particularly well, <laughs> is that um, if you could uh, speak to the relationships of power that are embodied in the discourse about the curator artist relationship and expand on that. But also well, yeah, economic sorry, as well as economic as well as yeah. Um, so I think that um, well, for, as a visual arts curator, I you know we never used to have contracts. You know, I mean, artists would come in and they would have work, and we would present the work. I mean, when I worked, you know, in alternative spaces in the South Bronx, there was there was nothing. I mean, we just opened the door and said we're doing you know an X Y Z show. People would with their work and we would have some volunteer help them install that work and there was a kind of um, wonderful kind of open-ended spirit to that that we were kind of all kind of doing this you know grassroots kind of um, <coughs> projects that were way ahead of what any institution was able to do because of the scale because we were off the map we were you know way in the margins um, and um, so um, the ecology of that was much more collegial now. I really, um, you know, it irks me every time I have to sign one of those contracts with the artists. <laughs> I mean, not because I don't feel like we should negotiate the economic relations and the power relations, but because I feel like more and more the artists are seeing what we're doing as like a job. Like, well, I have a job at YPCA and I have one at SF Moon and I have one at, you know, Kala, and each of them is providing me with X amount of resources so that I can do the work. And I, I've been very uncomfortable with that commodification of, of my relationship with the artist, um, which um, in many other ways is very fluid and social. So um, the, the labor, of, my labor also is something that I don't, and the labor of the institution as a whole isn't necessarily something that I feel is um, understood so much by the artist, and I think vice versa, that the institutions 
don't necessarily kind of get into the nitty gritty of, of the challenges that artists have in, in, in the economics of continuing to do their work, although we can all speak to that. I think it's interesting that both of us were the first to ground the mic from the visual art side, but I think that it is because there's this, you know, it's, I had to get my contract from Erin and say, how do you do this? Because I, I wasn't used to it, but I knew that it was a moral imperative for me, even though I have very meager resources in my program, like a tenth of what the performance program is, that it, I needed to pay artists who came a fee or something. I didn't know what I was going to call it, but I knew that that had to happen. <laughs> Um, but I, I'll use an anecdotal thing. This happened recently. I'm working with heavy industries, and we're only talking by email. And um, you know, when I invited them, they said, "Well, we're up for doing anything if the price is right." And to me, I, I welcome that conversation. I understood what they were saying because my invitation was so vague. We have this random school, and can you come? And where will you be coming from? Because I don't know if I can pull the ticket. Da -da -da. And we've had this really interesting exchange about money and what they can and can't do. And in one of their um, emails to me, they, they wrote this big diatribe, and at the end said, that's the first time we've ever said that. And it was shocking to me because I know the commissions that they receive from major institutions. And it's a silent kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. The negotiation is silent. I think it's, it sounds like it's much more rigorous from where you're standing. And, uh, last year, last year, the year before, we invited um, A.L. Steiner and Wage to come and give a talk about kind of that payment system that they are trying to um, establish based on the Canadian system of paying artists, you know, thirty-five dollars for every photo you use, and this whole thing. And it does feel uncomfortable because then it becomes all about this negotiation. But the transparency in that conversation allows you to get it out of the way and then get to the work and understand, and, and it's a different way of supporting the artists that may feel uncomfortable now, but it feels like we're moving to demystifying that secret money conversation. It's important to reveal the economy of the organization. You know, as soon as I say to heavy industry, here's my whole budget, and I'm trying to do 12 projects, they were like, okay, it seems like you're in the scale of this other organization that we worked with, and here's how they supported us, maybe we can do a project like this, and then the conversation just opened up. Um, I think this is a, a hugely complicated question. Um, and it's the tangled, the, the issue of power is a real issue, and there's a tangled web of relationships from the trustees down to um, the audience members. Um, and uh, Shannon's book, I think, is going to get into that a little bit. But what she was talking about last night, I, I started to hear something, and I was just wishful thinking. Um, the, uh, but. And there's so many people weighing in. Obviously, when the ICA decides to put forth an artist, we have chosen not to put forth 5,000 other artists that day. You know, um, and so yes, there's a kind of power involved, but there's also power, you know, from the critics, the artists, the uh, uh, front desk staff. Everyone has some say in it. One thing I'll tell you: never underestimate the power of the registrar. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just, it's a really tight web of, of everybody weighing in to get that experience um, that, that the audience ends up having with the art or art and or artists. Yeah, and I'll say that there's, you know, a real onus around transparency um, and around what I'm working with, what I have to offer and what I don't have to offer. And then even though when I say it's a collaboration, it can be messy, and it is messy, and but it's a constant dialogue around and a negotiation around what I can do, what I can provide, both economically, um, other resources, and that's where communication is so crucial around um, how we can pull this all together. You know, and I find the more transparency that we have around this is my bigger picture and what you brought up, Kristen, around yeah, this is what I'm working with. These are my challenges, and you know how we make this work in this particular moment. Um, but yeah, it's it's. There's always a moment around, um, sometimes we're lucky in performing arts to have some of those booking agent buffers <laughs> where you have certain conversations with one group of people and a different conversation with the artist. You know, sometimes that's the case and sometimes that's a good system in which you're, maybe it's a little more comfortable to, to yeah, I mean, but absolutely, I'm negotiating all, we all are negotiating all the time around the cost and it's ethically um, uncomfortable to know that you're, you're trying to get fees down by an artist who is working with very little resources to do what they do, but you're all also dealing with your own economic reality. Um, it's uncomfortable, but you know, those are all the realities. The more we can be open around 
that I find it's a better working relationship. Can I mention a few more things really quickly? One is that um, I've been having this conversation a lot, and I think that um, inter talking about writing and trying to interpret a time, um, I found um, Boris Groy's really uh, valuable tool for me, all of his writing, in interpreting the current moment and dissecting ideas around presenting an art and power and money, his new the e -flux that just came out with his art and money essay is excellent. And the second thing, just to bring up Tino Segal again, um, you know, um, in New York, of course, Tino is happening and Marina Abramovic are happening at the same time. And when I was working with an artist who had experience with both of them, um, he was talking about uh, those uh, dinners that Klaus Biesenbach is having at the MoMA when they're talking about how to collect performance and inviting these different people to talk about the money structure and how things happen. And this is a, a, a fifth generation story at this time, but I, I love to recount it, that um, Marina said to Tino, why is it that you can sell performance? And he said, um, you have to believe that immaterial has value. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is so often what we, you know, we don't talk about this. You know, we're in the business of presenting the immaterial, this in culture, the immaterial, this art culture, the US culture. And it was a really profound way of saying, you know, we're actually on the same side. I just found a different way of describing it to this institution of speaking their language and making them pay for it. But you're finding your economy, unfortunately, 35 years later, and have to do a whole bunch of things in order to make that happen. Jason? Um, I wanted to comment on the Tumblr, ar looked like a Tumblr archive, 
because that's so often how I visually associate things, and then the essay was in the footnotes. Um, and it was interesting to see a different population come to talk to me and call it an essay or a project or whatever it is, but I'm interested in breaking down that format. If we're presenting experimental work, then everything that surrounds to contextualize it should also be experimental. I have one last question. I have a question about, about the audience. And they, you mentioned you know, letting the artist run with the ball, but making sure the, art, the, the audience was following. Um, how do you deal with that, especially being kind of on, on the edge of um, artistic production, like the cutting edge of artistic production? And do, do you care about, um, what do you take into consideration in terms of audience? Are you building an audience? Let me just, how do you, how do you educate them about these forms also? Especially in performing arts where it's supposed to visual art show where you get, you know, show an older work that's a precedent. You can't do that when you're presenting performance. Okay, so just with relevant to performance mainly performing arts. This question performing arts and, and the audience. Performing arts with the audience, how do you how does the audience follow the artist when they're allowed to run with the wall? Well I think um, for us as we have been in, in PICA for the past fifteen years our audience is um, providing that context for each other. And we've uh, built a community of the context of the art <coughs> that are, um, they, they are the ones who are, our audience is moving along. They're a living archive of, of what's been seen and, and what they've helped build very literally um, because a lot of our, a lot of our audience um, are, are hands-on volunteers with our organization um, from, you know, people who are you know, literally helping to build those walls or to volunteer to get the artist's visa or to, um, to pick them up from the airport or whatever it is. So I think um, they, they have become kind of the stewards of, of that and that world history and they'll, and they'll say, oh, you know, remember Akram Khan who was here 10 years ago and how this show relates to that one? So I think having this kind of um, group of people um, who have uh, experienced art where the rules have been broken in a lot of different ways, they you know they show up and they're like, so do I get a seat? Is it going to be six hours or two minutes? Or am I talking? Is the artist going to sit on my lap? They just I mean they kind of come with this um, um, lack of pretty you know expectation actually of what is going to be there, which is a great you know opportunity for the new artist um, coming in because the audience um, is sort of um, open to the rules being different. Um, I, I, I mentioned that I spent a lot of time as a museum educator, and that plays into my thinking a lot. Um, but we don't just present cutting edge new. We do, I mean, the dance draw exhibition that I referenced is going to give precedent, and it'll, it'll bring it up to, to the present, but it starts with Judson Church, and um, really will help people understand both the connections between dance and drawing, but also the evolution of dance and how it's got to be like it is. Right. Um, we've, um, I just presented, um, Dilty Jones just recreated duets we've done in Barney's name, and I presented those um, as a way of sort of understanding why, you know, where he's coming to get the um, the, um, uh, I, I also... Is there a usual on day of the start of the life? Uh, <laughs> uh, one other thing I just want to say is that I started doing, um, I just did it a couple times, it was really successful, I'm going to make kind of a little more. Um, having a movement workshop before dance, mm -hmm. um, and letting the audience actually move, and, and learn, and when you can get the company to give up, half hour before the dance are somebody from the company and uh, it's really people that opens people's bodies to, to experience. Yeah, I mean, I think just very quickly, I mean, that's something to think deeply about. I want to continue to present challenging, provocative work, but I don't want to lose people either. You know, I want to bring in new artists that they won't have reference points for. Um, so one strategy is to bring artists back um, and to develop a relationship with an artist, you know, trajectory and practice over several years. But it also, you know, we're experimenting with what is, an, a, you know, an engagement education program. And so we're in a pilot phase, actually, around uh, an engagement program specifically for dance. And I'm co-developing with our community engagement team that looks at what are, what's an integrated way to start getting people 
um, you know, comfortable with inquiry around performance. We were taking on an integrated approach around an embodied practice, deep observation, and a didactic approach as well. So we're doing a lot of experimentation around that, and it, there's no one way, but it's got to be, it's an imperative though, um, because, you know, I think it's brilliant to bring in some historic aspects, but with certain programs, you know, for me, it, it's hard to do that, and I do have a particular interest in staying ahead and bringing in new and to continue to do that, but we've got to find tools to mediate and to give audiences that, that confidence to, to unpack work together. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, everyone, thank you so much. We're going to take a lunch break, and we hope to start as close, we will start at 1.45. Um, uh, I'm sorry that we aren't able to offer lunch to everybody gathered here, but if you hold out, you'll get a reception at the end. And I should, I should let you know, too, that the rest of the afternoon has a real mix of rhythms. We're going to be focusing on mic, uh, more micro-attention to some artists as well as larger, uh, larger panel with a more historical conversation. So we hope you'll return, and thanks to our panel for getting to off a great start. that don't have seats on them. So come on over, sit down. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're fortified. I'm glad we had such a wonderful day to, um, so we can adjourn periodically to that lovely terrace. Uh, and it's a, a tremendous pleasure to uh, launch the next panel. I will, uh, as I said, we're withdrawing um, formal introductions, but. Uh, oddly, it only occurred to me really a couple of days ago that the, this particular panel happens to be composed of Berkeley-based affiliates. I hadn't quite realized that, uh, because in many ways, Ann Walsh and uh, Trin Minha and Erica Balsam, I think of as these, their own unique individuals with these full biographies um, who needed to bring, be brought together. And in this other, uh, other way, I realized, oh yeah, that's right, they're all on campus. Um, but uh, we don't always have opportunities to bring everyone together, and I'm glad we could today, and uh, look forward uh, to hearing their reflections uh, around Minha's work and on time-based work, screen-based work in particular. Thanks. Okay. So let me test the new year in the back. Yeah. <laughs> How about this? Yes. Yes. So thank you very much, Shannon and uh, Michelle, and all uh, for you know bringing us together today and allowing me to share this work with you. And also uh, thank you, Anne and Erica, for working with me. In my films, you know, and books, I've been working with a range of figures, you know, of otherness, such as the foreigner, the outsider, the stranger, the wanderer, the one who leaves, the exile, the migrant, the voluntary and involuntary immigrant, and the refugee. And more recently, I've also focused on the figure of the walker both in an art project and in a book project. And so to respond to the focus of the conference, I would like to present today a work that lies between visual art and performance. One of the large-scale multimedia installations that I made in teamwork with artist and architect Jean-Paul Bourdieu, L'Autre Marche, or The Other Walk, which was completed for the opening of the new Museum of Mankind, the Musée du Quai Brandy in Paris, France, on June 2006, and held on view until June 2009. And as expected, 
the museum itself is a site of controversies and years of impassioned debates among politicians, intellectuals, art critics, administrators, and curators have preceded its inauguration. So much has been written about Gay Brandy before, during, and after its construction that I would only mention a few details relevant to our discussion. The museum brings together the French collections of several hundred thousands of pieces formerly housed at the Musée de l'Homme, founded in 1937 during the Universal Exhibition, and the Musée des Arts d'Afrique et d'Océanie, once a museum of colonies inaugurated during the International Colonial Exhibition in 1931. Much of the protests around the Musée du Quai Bandy, a project backed by President Jacques Chirac, remain largely caught in die-hard forms of oppositional thinking. These were voiced explicitly as a struggle with the more evident sources of imperial power, such as Chirac and his architect Jean Nouvel, but they circulate more insidiously as a struggle of power between knowledges and expertise Blatantly acting out in much of the criticism of the museum is the conventional fault line between the arts and the social sciences, or between aesthetic and so-called scientific demands, anthropology, sociology, or history versus performing plastic and time-based arts, for example. Some scholars and experts invited on the opening days of the museum were in sense that they have not been consulted more closely. And most of the reactions unleashed around what they thought to be right versus wrong representations were extremely territorial in nature. For those who preach context versus form, the museum authorities replied by pointing cleverly to what they see as innovation data and contextual information tactfully kept to the virtual realm thanks to new technology. This is like solving problems under the carpet rather than addressing them. Largely eluded are questions related to the nature and origins of the objects on display, as well as the very politics of objectifying in acquiring, collecting, displaying, classifying, narrating, and archiving whether for a scientific or an artistic purpose. Also eluded is the architecture's role in fetishizing them by dramatically isolating, clustering, cramming them in confined, over-determined spaces. Obviously, a focus on form, per se, does not necessarily elevate or restore the object to its full aesthetic merit, quote unquote although it may help to detach it from the surrounding gloom of pseudo-scientific discourse. Translated into English, L'Autre Marche could be both the other walk and the other is walking. The installation was realized in collaboration with Jean-Paul Baudier upon invited international competition. I was among four installation artists from different historical and cultural backgrounds from whom they had requested proposals for the RAM, the others being Alan Fleischer, Chris Marker, and Tony Orsler. Jean-Paul's contribution was crucial in making the link between the evolving architectural data of the building and the precise design for the art installation. Because during the two and a half years we worked on the project, everything about and around the museum was research in progress. Even the data first given in the architectural drawings that concerned the space for our installation kept on changing every time we showed up at the site of construction making it very difficult for us to plan what exactly could go into the project 
when, where, and how. Can I have the first um, two images? So it was with the first proposal that we put together in February 2004 for a huge project running along the 160 meter long run that precedes the entrance to the museum exhibition halls that we want the installation project. You can see it here, you know, uh, the very, very uh, rough sketch that you have and what is happening, what is represented as happening in the ramp in these three patterns. Little did we know then, when we accepted the project, how complex and demanding its realization turned out to be, not only in its scale and scope, but more so in terms of intricacies of power relations. Kay Bonny being a politically controversial presidential project of ambitious breadth. What followed was a lengthy, most challenging work process in which we had had to negotiate tightly between our artistic endeavor and the impositions of a system ruled by heavy French bureaucracy. So during these two years and a half, working not only with the diverse scientific, technical, administrative, and production hierarchies, but also directly and indirectly with the museum's star architect. Ultimately, the problem of how initial intents, ideas, and plans went awry in the process was not so much to be found in the usual gap between the conceptual and the real realization stages as in the imperial attitude towards what qualifies as original or what counts as art, and with it, the hierarchies of power that operate at every stage of production. Chirac was one of the very few prominent heads of state to publicly affirm his alliance with contemporary indigenous movements that despite the anti-ethnocentric and decolonizing claims voiced with skills and care by the president to promote respect for indigenous struggles and les arts premiers, his star architect interiorly ruled over the space of the museum which he considered to be his exclusive territory. There was no room for discussion. Everything was recklessly judged by the light of all-knowing Western individualism. France, more than any other prominent European countries, has gladly turned a blind eye to the post-colonial question and is very slow in recognizing the significance and impact of it in its current relations to its ex-colonies. In its hubristic narrative about its others, even the French left has been in deep denial of its legacies of colonialism in the way it protects its colored citizens, extolling and dismissing them in the same breath. No wonder that despite the all too good initial intention the place given to Aboriginal art at Cape Hardy remains so problematic. Through the architect's vision, not only the Aboriginal artists' work are confined to the administrative annex quarters behind the museum. Some of the work can be seen on the ceiling of administrator's office when one comes in from the back entrance reserved to the museum staff. So not only um, the Aboriginal artist's work are confined to the administrative <coughs> annex quarters behind the museum, and hence conveniently set apart from the main museum event. It also runs the risk, in the way it is treated, of being reduced to a genre of the primitive and a kind of interior design aesthetics. As artists, we wear, so to speak, one of the colorful pegs in the strategic machinery that allows the museum to appropriate a colorful aesthetic position. So being the very first artistic event, can I have the next one? Being the very first artistic event that the museum 
visitor experience and have to go through before having access to the inside space of the museum. Lotre Marche functions as a potentially transformative walk whose fluid movement in three phases is suggested by these three aphorisms projected on the floor. With each step, the world comes toward us. With each step, a flower blooms under our feet, learning how to walk anew. To each phase correspond a visual rhythm, a sound environment, and a body in movement position. To each screen or screen space correspond a sequence of images peculiar to a culture. For example, Senegal in Senegal, Tokoro, Mandingo, Yola, and Sonike in Yemen, in Vietnam, China, Japan, Indonesia, and USA. These images are selected and structured rhythmically so as to walk on the visitor's perception and prepare the latter in their journey amidst the museum's material environments of world cultures. They unfold in 19 autonomous video sequences projected on screens, on the floor, on the side walls, with 19 shifting aphorisms in 12 different languages intermittently appearing and disappearing along the winding ramp as they are also projected in punctuation with the image. Can we show the DVD? Does anyone know how to correct the sound? You should stop it. Okay.
we have the light on? So, um, the passage through the ramp is as ancient Asian journeying practices have it. A walk in which the world comes to the visitor with each step. As it is often said, what is miraculous is not to walk on water, but to walk on earth. Walking is an experience of indefiniteness and of infinity. With each step forward, one receives wide open into oneself, the gift of the universe. Here it is never a question of discovering the world, a term so endearing to the colonial quest and conquest. Rather, the focus is all on the ability to receive and the expansive nature of reception. The course taken along the ramp between sound's image and aphorism, between the said and the seen, the here, there, and elsewhere, happens as an ascending walk when one enters the museum and as a descending walk when one exits the museum. Meaning moves with walking and with the coming and going of the aphorism. With each step taken, relations between passage, passerby, and passing time are mutually activated. Questions raised through sexual experience could incite the visitor to live anew his or her intimate activities as spectator, researcher, visitor. Awareness of a different walking toward the self, the other, and the world takes place in the space between l'autre musée. We have initially conceived the screen space and projections placements as closely related to body-mind movements. Visual rhythms are accordingly devised as acts of welcoming, of blooming, and of blossoming in multiplicities. To be intensely aware of one's body while walking, that is, of where one puts one's weight, how it feels to head forth, to linger, to step left, right, or around, how in following one's feet, one turns one's head, moves one's shoulder, lifts up one's chin, or lowers it, to look down while stepping into and across an image, for example. All this is to come back to the very basics of walking, and hence to be able to unlearn the individuality, let's say ideological, cultural, personal, to unlearn the individuality of a walking while learning how to walk anew, free. Conceived as a supplement to, and yet standing distinctly apart from the museum project that remains bound to collecting and exhibiting material objects, the installation is meant to expand the visitor's receptive faculties through the choreography of immaterial elements. Here, sound, digital images, and aphorism projected along the ramp. At the core of the project lies the very element and the very event of light, whose immateriality and changing intensity make and unmake the image, saturate or efface them. Unlike the walled spaces inside the museum, the ramp is a hybrid space whose challenge is twofold. On the one hand, it is both partly outdoor and partly indoor, and hence the unevenness of the existing light on the other, it is a passage, and hence, as the star architect insists, the installation we create should not be so compelling as to make visitors stop, <laughs> blocking the way into the museum. So this is very ironic a situation for, to find oneself in when one is a filmmaker. But the challenge became part of the installation. Because of the shifting quality of the ambient light, the project comes and goes in its differing degrees of visibility. It partly appears, disappears, and reappears according to the time of the day, as well as to the weather and the season of the year. Most important to the installation are the technical details around screens, 
projectors lumens output as well as ambient light. Despite all the mechanism of control set up around the project, which was submitted as required in half a dozen of stages while in progress to a committee of six to eight members that includes not only the architect and the curator, but also the leading staff of the diverse scientific, technical, financial, and architectural departments. So this, despite all these mechanisms of control, the museum administration miss out on the crucial role image and light fundamentally play in the project. In the end, given to the architect's whims and to too overwhelmed by the colossal undertaking to care about artists' projects, the staff failed to consult us and made quick, important, last-minute technical decision without much concern for the integrity or the spirit of the installation. This includes, for example, using regular white screens instead of the daylight screen, that is, high-definition gray screens made for protection in full outdoor light, as we have specified. So this is just an example, among others. Um, and you can see that the production team they hired came totally unprepared for the task at the end. Ultimately, the written and visual description of the installation finally elaborated in its concept and carefully detailed in its technical support during the years spent on the project were of little use. So we could not help you know, but laugh in the midst of utter despair when we found out about the whole mess upon our arrival in Paris to supervise the final stage of the installation before the presidential inauguration of the museum. It took us a lot of perseverance, alternately begging and yelling to bring the project to an acceptable stage. As mentioned, we made the available light part of our artistic endeavor, and we expected the project to fade in and fade out to a certain degree, but we were far from expecting it to disappear almost entirely at certain times of the day, noon to 3 p.m., for example, especially during summer when the light outside is particularly bright. This was the frustrating situation with the project on the inauguration day, and during the couple months after, when it was still in progress. Immediate responses we got then from visitors, friends, and acquaintances varied widely from those who barely noticed it and thought it was invisible. Those and those who were so taken in by it as to linger on the ramp for several hours before they proceeded to the interior exhibiting space of the museum. This was also how we intensely learned that cloudy, rainy days and winter time could turn out to be our installation's best friends. 